disturbing reports of violations of freedom of religion or belief in the Indian state of Manipur over the past year have been rightly highlighted by the International Religious Freedom or Belief Alliance, of which the UK is a member under the leadership of the Member of Parliament for Congleton, Fiona Bruce MP, the Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion or Belief. Would the Foreign Secretary confirm his support for the Bill to place the vital international role of Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Forb on a statutory footing, a Bill which I hope to bring forward to this House in the next few weeks when it concludes its current stages in another place? The statutory establishment of this ro uh, role was a recommendation of the Truro Review I was honoured to author and the implementation of which remains government policy. I can certainly give the Right Reverend Pranat that uh, confirmation. Uh, I very much agree with the Bill. In fact, I insisted that it went forward with um, government support. I think Fiona Bruce does an excellent job in this regard. And for the first time, one of these governmental envoys will be placed on a statutory footing. And I think that reflects the importance that we in this government and in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office attach to the importance of um, celebrating the importance of freedom of religious belief. She does a great job and she'll be able to do it on a statutory basis. Build on the success of his department at the 2022 Commonwealth Heads of Government Conference, which managed to include the words that freedom of religion or belief is the cornerstone of a democratic society. And will he encourage his officials to do two things? Firstly, to emphasise that this is not exceptionalism, that Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that everyone has the right to believe, not to believe or to change their belief, is about every human being's right. And secondly, that there's empirical evidence that shows that those countries that promote freedom of religion or belief are the most prosperous and the most stable in the world. And if you look at factors like the 100 14 million displaced people in the world, it's often in countries where there isn't such freedom. The, the Noble Lord speaks with great passion and knowledge about this. I would say that uh, my department does take this very seriously. Not only have we set up this uh, envoy and are putting that into legislation, we have dedicated staff in the FCDO that look at um, freedom of religious belief. Uh, my Noble Lord, my friend the Noble Lord, um, uh, Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon led at the United Nations Security Council in June together with UAE in defence of a motion on freedom of religious belief and of course in response to the report by the Right Reverend Prelate, um, uh, the, the Bishop of Truro, uh, we do commemorate Red Wednesday. I want to reassure my noble friends, not, um, this is not a political moment, it's a moment where we celebrate and we, we make clear how important it is people have freedom of relig religious belief and how we stand up for those being persecuted for their beliefs. And I think on the last occasion of Red Wednesday, we lit up the FCDO uh, in red, something which, on, in other circumstances, I hope is not going to happen any time soon. Yeah. <laughs> My Lords, it is almost exactly ten years ago since the noble lord, the minister, um, s stated in the other place that the mass killing of thousands of, tens of thousands of Sikhs in 1984 was one of the greatest blots in the history of post-partition India. It's true that India has what, it is, what is called a secular constitution, but since then, uh, we've had the riots in Ayodhya where tens of thousands of Muslims were killed. And then we had the Home Minister describing the Muslims as termites. Then there was a mosque, a uh, Hindu temple built on the raised mosque. And uh, Christians have been persecuted again and again. And Sikhs are told that if they behave like Hindus, they are um, fine. Otherwise, they're termed separatists. Does the noble Lord the minister, minister agree that um, India is a member of the Commonwealth and shouldn't freedom of belief be at the forefront of the Commonwealth Charter? Well, I thank the noble Lord for his question. I, I'll never forget the visit I made to Amritsar. It's one of the most beautiful places I've, I've ever been, one of the most peaceful places. But of course, uh, the memories of what happened there, it's very important that we acknowledge uh, what happened and how wrong it was. The point he makes about the importance of religious tolerance, of, of um, freedom of religious belief in India, uh, they are important points. And of course, there, are, there have been occasions 
um, where it's been something that we've raised with the Indian government. And I think that should continue to be uh, the case. I mean, the original question was about the situation in Manipur, where there has been a very good report written by uh, David Campanali, which I've, I've studied. And I think it's right to say that we shouldn't downplay the religious aspects of some of this strife. Yes, sometimes it is um, communal or, or tribal or ethnic, but there, in many cases, is a clear religious part of it, and we should be clear about that. My lords, my lords. I'm moving the question out, I think, to an issue that I think is close to the Foreign Secretary's heart, and that is on the delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals, and particularly religious tolerance is important in creating a secure world. He will be aware that India is going to be key to delivering the Sustainable Development Goals. And I wonder if you can inform the House of any discussions he's had recently with the Indian government on how they can play a role with us in partnership to ensure they're delivered. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have an excellent dialogue with uh, the Indian government in, in all sorts of ways. In fact, I spoke to Foreign Minister Jay Shankar just at the weekend, um, and uh, my uh, noble friend Lord, Lord, Ar Lord Ahmed um, visits frequently and has a very deep dialogue. I have a good relationship with uh, Prime Minister Modi, and we discuss all of these things. In terms of meeting the Sustainable Development Goals, the most important thing India can do is to continue to grow and lift people out of poverty, because there are still, you know, I think, I think it's true to say, uh, more people in India um, below the poverty line than there are in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the need for India to grow and pull people out of poverty is very great. But obviously, one of the things we're going to be discussing at the G20 and elsewhere is how to scale up the de multilateral development banks in which India has a voice to make sure we have the financing available to meet those development goals. Are a positive for the whole world and not to be commended to the Indian authorities. Uh, but all too often there have been harassment and intimidation by the Indian government when there's been reporting of human rights concerns as well as freedom of religion concerns, including the necessity of the BBC uniquely to restructure within India so that it is no longer operating in India like it operates in any other country in the world. Would the Foreign Secretary confirm to me that we are not offering market access to India for media, data and telecoms on an unequal basis? so that the freedoms that we should enjoy in this country when it comes to the BBC and open media to report human rights concerns should exist in India also, and we are not giving preferential market access when we are not offered that there. The global law makes a very good point about the rumbustious nature of Indian democracy. I think India should be proud of being the biggest uh, democracy in the world. Uh, like all democracies, there are imperfections, as there are in our own country, but we should celebrate the scale of their democracy. The point he makes about the BBC is important. I mean, my understanding is that India passed a law insisting that digital media companies had to be Indian-owned, and the BBC has had to restructure on that basis. Now, I don't think that's not the British way of insisting that all media has to be domestically owned, although I know some in this place and elsewhere have been tempted by those moves. And I myself have sometimes uh, fantasized about that when reading things um, that I've read. But nonetheless, that's the reason why the BBC has restructured, together with some disagreements with India. The point he then goes on to make about the trade deal, I will take away and look at. Uh, my understanding where we are with the trade deal is good market access has been offered on both sides, but not quite enough yet to secure a deal. And I think it's important with these trade deals to make sure you only really get one proper shot at it, so make sure it's a good enough deal and will be welcomed by industry leaders here in the UK as real market access. But on the point on media access, I, I will have to go away and look at that. Personally, I would say, let's open up media access on both sides in order to make sure we have a good, good plurality of media. My Lords, um, I, I first of all want to thank the Right uh, Reverend Prelate for his continuing focus on Christian persecution and his comprehensive true report. In that report, it's noted that Foreign Office staff are often not equipped to deal with these terrible issues, and a recommendation was made for mandatory training for all FCDO staff on religious diversity and inclusivity. The current training is not mandatory. Perhaps the Foreign Secretary could tell us why. 
Oh, I thank the noble lady for that question. I'll have to take that one away and look at it. There's a lot of diversity training in the FCDO. There is a dedicated uh, number of staff for dealing with freedom of religious belief uh, questions, but I will certainly ask the specific question about whether the training uh, is included in this particular area. Question, Baroness Heater of Kentish Town. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, no country has done more than the UK to maintain physical and moral support for Ukraine. Our military support has made a critical difference on the battlefield and paved the way for others to follow. Our fiscal support has helped to keep the Ukrainian economy going. The British people have invited over 280,000 Ukrainians into their homes, and this July we intend to sign a 100-year partnership agreement to demonstrate that a century from now the UK and Ukraine will still be standing shoulder to shoulder. I, th I thank the Minister for that and for his efforts uh, in, in the States recently, because, as he says, it is imperative that moral as well as military support is maintained, not just to reassure Ukrainians that we'll back them till they win, but to make sure that Russia knows that we will do that too. But given that the Kremlin does watch our every move, wouldn't a multi-year commitment have given a clearer signal to Putin that we were there until U Ukraine wins, rather than the just the one-year £2 billion programme that was announced. I've just come from a meeting with uh, a delegation from the Polish Parliament who thanked the, us for all the things that the Foreign Secretary has now said and were full of praise for us. But they noted, interestingly, that they hadn't prepared their people for what happened in February 2022. And those parliamentarians from Poland said that the challenge now is for all of us to persuade the people of our nations that this fight is worth it. So will the Foreign Secretary make the case domestically to stand firm against Putin in the interests not just of Ukraine, but for the whole of Europe, because Europe, Ukraine is actually fighting our war? I thank the noble lady for her question. I would say that one of the strengths of Britain's position in this regard is the huge cross-party support there is in terms of our backing for Ukraine. So, of course, one can argue that multi-year packages would be even better than individual year packages, but I think Ukraine is confident and should be confident that we will go on providing the right level of support uh, in this country in the years ahead. Of course, we don't know what that right level will be. Um, in terms of uh, talking quite rightly, as she says, about keeping that support here in the UK. I think there is an innate understanding in this country of the danger of giving in to bullies in Europe. We learned that lesson in the 1930s. Appeasing Hitler didn't bring peace. It ultimately led to war. The way to deal with bullies is to stand up to them and be strong, and that's what this government uh, is doing. In addition, in, in addition to the obvious need for the Ukrainians for combat aircraft, and, um, and munitions, can we, in the present situation, at least make sure with our allies that they obtain uh, the kind of uh, super-efficient anti-projectile and anti-missile system as it seems to be available to the Israelis? Uh, and can we in ensure that the same standards are provided to the Ukrainians? Their system is good, but it clearly could be better still, and shouldn't we just work on that? Well, what I say to my, my, my noble friend is, at the NATO foreign ministers' meeting last week, there was a very clear request from the Ukrainian foreign minister for two things. First of all is the artillery shells to make sure they stay in the fight um, against Russia in the days ahead. But second, crucially, um, air, air defences, particularly Patriot missile systems, which have been so um, effective. And I know action is being taken by us and others on both those subjects to try and make sure we do um, everything we can. I think he's absolutely right to point out that how effective the Israeli uh, anti-missile system was, and it shows what can be done if you have the right resources in place. My Lords, the noble Lady Baroness Hayter rightly reminds us about the UK commitment to Ukraine, and it's absolutely right that we need to keep focused on that. But in light of the events at the weekend, 
and the fact that those Iranian drones didn't succeed reminds us, though, that many of the drones that are being sent towards Ukraine from Russia are actually Iranian drones. So what is His Majesty's government doing with allies to look at the relationship between Iran and Russia and whether there is something we can do because we shouldn't be looking at these incidents in isolation? I, I think the, the, the noble lady makes a, makes a very good point. We don't look at these things in isolation. Indeed, in the contracts I've had with the Iranian Foreign Minister, we repeatedly make the point uh, about the uh, unacceptability of the weapons supply to, um, to Russia. Over and above that, we're putting sanctions in place on every country and company that we can where we find them supplying these um, weapons. And we're there will be consequences if they continue to supply not just drones but also um, uh, more substantial missiles um, to Russia. This is something we're working together on and we recognise the importance of dealing with. Claire, my interest in the register. My Lords, the, the UK led the world in, legislation to, in terms of legislation to ban Russian oil imports uh, in, in 2022, but we still import Russian nuclear fuel into the, into the UK, which is a major energy security and national security issue for the country. Uh, and, and this, my Lords, is, is not due to be phased out until 2030. So does the Minister agree that we need to urgently legislate to bring this date forward to the near term, as our allies in the US are doing, with all of the attendant benefits for our domestic industry? I, I agree we should look at this. Uh, we have been effective in terms of uh, taking Russian gas out of our system, in terms of taking Russian oil out of our system. And I think if you look across Europe, it's been pretty remarkable what steps have been taken to reduce the dependence mm. on Russian oil and gas. Just last week, we made the announcement about excluding Russia from the London Metals Exchange uh, and other related exchanges. And I think this is the next area we should look at. I've had a letter from the Ukrainian Foreign Minister that I saw just this morning um, about this issue, and we're certainly going to take it away and look at it. It is, of course, a case um, for the Department of Energy and Net Zero. It's their responsibility. They deal specifically with Urenco, the company that delivers our nuclear fuel, but we'll take this away. I certainly welcome uh, the Foreign Secretary's uh, continued unity with the opposition. We're one uh, with them and uh, one with the government in terms of defeating Russian aggression. Recently, he said that we will ensure that we can make sure Russia pays for its aggression through the use of frozen assets. He said he would want to seek unity between the G7 and the EU. Can he update us on that? Can I also raise another issue that I've raised with the noble Lord, Lord Ahmed, frequently, which is uh, the two billion from the sale of Chelsea, which is still languishing somewhere. Uh, can he update us and say why we are not able to ensure that two billion is used for the immediate support of the people of Ukraine? I can certainly update um, the House um, on, on both of those issues. On the issue of how we use the frozen Russian assets, I've been the perhaps one of the most enthusiastic about this, just seeing you've got the frozen assets, you know Russia's going to have to pay reparations, give the money now to Ukraine, get it paid back by the reparations when they come. Um, the, the, the difficulty is, is trying to get consensus around the EU and in the United States. And to be fair to European Union countries, the majority of the sovereign assets are in their countries. They have the direct interest in it, particularly Belgium with the money in Euroclear. I think there is an emerging consensus that the interest on those assets can be used to support much larger financial support for Ukraine. So I'm confident at the uh, G7 foreign ministers and at the G7 meeting a, an answer around which America, the UK, France, Germany, others can coalesce. And if we can get that done, we really will be able to provide real financial firepower to Ukraine, as I, based on those assets rather than delivering the assets directly. On the Chelsea situation, it's immensely frustrating because that, that as he says, I think it could be as much as two and a half billion, is sitting there, potentially one of the biggest charitable organisations in Britain, and it's very frustrating we can't get money out of the door. The disagreement is whether all of the money has to go 
into Ukraine for the benefit of people of Ukraine who have suffered from the war, or whether any of the money can be spent in other countries, not Russia, not Belarus, but have suffered from the Ukraine war. That is the difficulty with the people who set up this trust, and we have to try and resolve that with the European Union, with Portugal, where um, uh, Abramovich, I think, has citizenship. We're working very hard because what I don't want is for month after month to go by and the money hasn't got out of the door. So we're working at it very hard, but it is difficult to try and get everybody into alignment. But we're on it. Uh, my Lord, if we actually believe that Putin is a threat to the West, shouldn't we start thinking about defending ourselves? And if so, has my noble friend, the Foreign Secretary, considered following the Swedish example of total defense service, including selective system of conscription. It would, at any rate, bolster young people's self-confidence, teach them to work in teams, and give them the skills necessary to find a job once they leave the service. A lunch with the Swedish Foreign Minister yesterday to celebrate Sweden's accession to NATO, and they are an incredibly capable country. They're financially robust, they have very good armed forces, superb equipment, they're going to make NATO a lot stronger. I'm not going to be tempted down the line of sort of national service and all of that, but I think we're clearly going to need to improve the way we encourage people to join our armed forces, to encourage young people to join our armed forces, to make sure we get people to join our reserves, to make sure we meet all those targets. But I do think the core of our effort as a highly professional uh, Army, Navy and Royal, uh, Royal Air Force, that, that is the key to our defence. I ask beg leave to call the question in my name on the order paper. Uh, my Lords, last week the Prime Minister and President Macron spoke on illegal migration and European security. On Thursday, I will speak to Foreign Minister Sejourné at the G7, and I'm confident that the Prime Minister and President Macron will meet again in person before too long. My colleagues, the Defence and Home Secretaries and their teams similarly maintain regular action oriented dialogue with their French counterparts. In the light of the forthcoming elections in the United States, and the constant reiteration of senior Russians that tactical nuclear weapons should be used in their invasion of Ukraine, would it not be a very good thing if the French and British heads of government got together and discussed their own targeting strategies for the nuclear weapons that they possess in Europe and give some guidance to the world and to Europe and above all to the Russians about their attitudes to this constant invocation of nuclear weapons being used in Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thank the Noble Lord for his question. He clearly has huge experience in this area. What I would say is that the House, Lancaster House agreement that, that I signed um, uh, with President Sarkozy in 2010 expressly sets out areas where Britain and France will collaborate, and that does include the most sensitive areas of, of uh, nuclear weapon research and nuclear weapons. But if what he's saying is there a deeper dialogue we need to enter into to think about these things for the future, I would agree. Of course, Britain's nuclear deterrent is declared to NATO, and I'm in favour of us having deeper conversations with the French about this, but I still maintain that one of the aims of, of NATO um, as, as, as uh, Pag Ismay would have put it, was to keep the Americans in and the Russians out, um, I think is still absolutely key to NATO's future. I missed out that bit, he will be pleased to notice, um, is key to NATO's future. And I think one of the things we have to do is to make sure we're talking to all parts of the uh, American system um, to, to make sure that NATO is in the strongest possible shape in its 75th year, with more members, more members be reaching 2%, so that whoever becomes president um, at the end of this year can see that NATO is an institution worth investing in. My, my lords, my lords, there is no display of French, British Heavy. cooperation Heavy. than... Having in an earlier incarnation had the opportunity to introduce the French Minister of Defence to our nuclear facilities. And in myself visiting Saint-Nazaire, uh, where the French showed me their facilities as well. The importance of the previous background of our nuclear collaboration, this is where Lord Lord Owen is absolutely right. 
against a background where perhaps the United States is showing less interest in NATO and maybe future involvement may not be so obvious and immediate. Make clear that the nuclear arrangements and nuclear understanding between this country and France is of manifest importance. If I may say so, I think the point about the Prime Ministers of both countries and the Foreign Secretaries need to be very closely involved against the dangerous situation that we face in Europe at the present time. Yeah. Yeah. The Noble Lord has huge experience of this. I would say it is a great year for Britain and France to be talking about these things. It's the 120th anniversary of the Entente Cordiale. We'll be commemorating D-Day again in June. There's the French Olympics, which we're sure will be a great success, and <coughs> we are helping them with security and, and other issues. So, of course, that dialogue in line with the Lancaster House Agreement and its renewal will be part of it. But I, I would say to the House it's important we try to encourage America to see NATO as a huge positive. And, you know, one mustn't over-interpret this, but it was good news when uh, yesterday the U.S. Speaker of the House of Representatives made this remark about the Ukraine funding. He said, we have terrorists and tyrants and terrible leaders around the world like Putin, and they're watching to see if America will stand up for its allies and our own interests around the globe, and we will. And when asked about the Ukraine funding, said he expected to bring it forward this week. Now, there is positive news. So as well as all the things we should be doing with European partners to strengthen NATO, we should do everything we can to encourage America to see it as part of its defence as well as ours. The summit would... My Lord, we, we now know that the European Political Summit's fourth meeting will take place in Blenheim in July, the European Political Community. One of Macron's major initiatives to encourage all European countries uh, to work together in security terms and, in particular, to form a British-French partnership in leading European security. Can the Foreign Minister tell us when uh, the Government will be telling us more about what the agenda will be and how far it is going to consult with other parties about this particularly important multilateral summit in which Britain and France were playing leading roles? Yeah. Well, first of all, I am delighted that the EPC, the, the European Political um, Community meeting, is going ahead. I am delighted it is at Blenheim, because that is in my old constituency and one of the finest uh, places in Britain to hold a summit. Uh, we won't necessarily remind all the participants who was on which side at Blenheim, but um, I'm sure we can find a way through that. In fact, there were in fact Germans on both sides, so that um, perhaps will, will help. We'll certainly be talking, I'm sure, about security. We'll be talking about uh, Ukraine. And I'm sure there'll be discussions as well about the issue of illegal migration, which we're all wrestling with around Europe. But I'm sure the Prime Minister will have more to say about it closer to the time. Brown. 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 I do not disagree with the Foreign Secretary about the importance of the United States, but whether we like it or not, we are in a context where future US leadership can be hoped for but not relied upon. Uh, and in such a context, events cooperation and coordination between the UK, France and the wider EU is crucial. President Macron has said, and I quote, our partnership with the UK must be raised to a different level. Given the open, that openness to a deeper defence and strategic relationship, what discussions has the government had with France and other European allies in respect of the very important issue of coordinating defence production to ensure that our procurement harmonises rather than conflicts with the proposed European Defence Industry Programme? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A very important question, and what I'd say to the noble lord is, first of all, I think that the way that the UK has worked with um, European power, other European powers in response to Ukraine has shown that wh while we're outside the European Union, we can work together very effectively and put in place arrangements like those around the Wiesbaden arrangements and others that work extremely well. Of course, we should look at what other cooperation and collaboration we should do. Uh, but I think there are some quite a lot of clarity that will be required, including about the European uh, defence industrial strategy, about you know, on what terms is it open 
to non-EU members because this only you know, collaboration makes sense if we're acting in a way that is benefiting not just our own industries as well as other European industries, but is also open to collaboration with others at the same time. So, I, I, from, so far from everything I've seen in this job is where you have good ad hoc arrangements and can make them work, that may well be better than a very structured and potentially rather bureaucratic dialogue unless you're really getting what you want. My Lord, one area that the United Kingdom and France have worked closely together and given leadership on is nutrition. And I was very pleased to see that we've now uh, got a date uh, for the Paris Nutrition for Growth Summit, which will take place uh, not this year, sadly, but next year on the 27th and 28th of March. Can he tell us, will he be raising support for the Nutrition for Growth Summit uh, when he meets his counterpart? And will the Prime Minister be involved to ensure that the leadership both countries have given in terms of alleviating the world's problem of nutrition is delivered properly and we remain supportive? I'll certainly raise that with my... Um, European counterpart um, Stéphane Sejourné. The, the first of these summits actually happened at the London Olympics in 2012, um, but partly because it's a very important issue, but because we knew that Brazil, that has a very deep concern about this issue, was carrying out the next Olympics, so we could create that momentum. It was more difficult in Tokyo because of COVID and everything else, but I think this is a good opportunity to get this back on the road, and I'll certainly raise it with my counterpart. My Lords, there surely was no better display of French-British cooperation than in the skies of the Middle East on Saturday mm, yeah, night. Yeah, yeah. 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 Will uh, the uh, Foreign Secretary discuss with his French counterpart how we can increase the pressure on the regime in Tehran so that they <coughs> might decide to allow the region to live in peace? I think the noble lord, my noble friend, makes a very good point. Um, in our case, uh, I can say to the House that uh, the Americans asked us to backfill their operations, our joint operations, of what, was op what is Op Shader, where we've been running a counter ISIL, counter Daesh operation in Iraq and Syria for many years now. And we're delighted to do that, to free up more of their planes to defend Israel. And at the same time, of course, we told our pilots they should shoot down any projectiles coming. Israel's way in the process and that's exactly what they did and they did it with great skill and great ability and he's right to say that Britain and France can work very closely together on this agenda. In terms of Iran we have sanctioned um, hundreds of uh, people in Iran. We've sanctioned the IRGC in its entirety. We'll be discussing with the French and others further steps we can take in order to um, discourage Iran from this behaviour, further sanctions that should be put in place. We also need to look at the work we do together at the uh, uh, International Atomic Energy Authority, uh, where we do need to have clear resolutions when Iran is in breach of the promises that it's made. And I think the point he makes more generally is right. When you look at this region, who is funding Hamas, who is funding the Houthis, who's funding Hezbollah, in every case, the answer is Iran. My Lord's apologies, and to the noble Lord Markham in particular, not currently in his place, for becoming impatient and intemperate during yesterday's <laughs> questions. Um, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. I'm worried already. Um, but, um, <laughs> my Lords, we value the role of the Council of Europe, and we are a major contributor to the organisation. The Council of Europe's commitments to peace, freedom and democracy is best evidenced by its swift decision to expel Russia following the brutal invasion of Ukraine and the launch of the Register of Damage, which will allow individuals to file claims for loss, injury and damage caused by Russia's invasion. The 75th anniversary will be celebrated at the ministerial meeting in May. I am sincerely grateful to the noble Lord of the Foreign Secretary for what I think was an unequivocal answer to my question. Um, we all know that he has um, an awesome responsibility at the moment to practice statecraft globally and to seek to explain it at home. Um, with that in mind, when he is considering institutions like the UN, like NATO, like the Council of Europe, and dare I say it, the European Court of Human Rights, would he categorise them 
as international and worthy of our continued commitment and support, or foreign and worthy of repudiation and occasional contempt. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the noble lady is. I mean, the, the the Council of Europe is so much more than the European Court of, of, of Human Rights. It's got over 200 conventions. Uh, they make practical contributions to things like uh, the St Denis Convention on Safety and Sport that underpinned the UK and Ireland's successful bid to host the 2028 European Football Championships. You've got the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing Violence Against Women, the Istanbul Convention. Um, that helps the UK promote its gender equality priorities. And we should always keep the ECHR, uh, the court, you know, in proper context. I mean, since 1975, there have been 21,784 cases and only, um, I think, 329 judgments against the UK. So we have relatively little incoming, but, and it is a big but, there are occasions, in my view, when this court overreaches itself. And we saw one last week um, with respect to climate change where it took a judgment against Switzerland. And I think it's dangerous when these courts overreach themselves because ultimately we're going to solve climate change through political will, through legislation in this house and the other place, by the actions we take uh, as politicians, by the arguments we put to the electorate. And so I do think there's a danger of overreach, but the Council of Europe overall is a good thing. My Lord, my Lord. Uh, the, the, my Lord, the Foreign Secretary mentioned the recent European Court of Human Rights judgment on climate change. Did you have a chance to look at Tim Ike KC's dissenting judgment when he said it was extraneous and went beyond its judicial remit? So, further to the Foreign Secretary's uh, reply to the main question, what sort of reform did he have in mind and what changes can be made to improve the court? Well, I, I did look at the dissenting judgment, and I thought it was pretty frank and clear. Um, we have made reforms to uh, the European Court of Human Rights. Um, the noble Lord, Lord Clark, battled very hard uh, in the coalition government to achieve the uh, Brighton Declaration, which was an improvement. We've made some changes recently on Article 39. So I think there are changes you can make, but I do think it will partly depend on the court's attitude to how far it, it takes its mission beyond the actual convention rights. And you know, I'm not an expert on the convention, but I don't think it mentions climate change. And as I said, climate change or you know, the rights we have in terms of our health service or education, these are things we should be legislating for in Parliament, accountable politicians to their electorates, rather than depending on a, a court. So reform is necessary, and reform is going through, but I think there also needs to be a balance here uh, about leaving to nation states those things that they should be deciding themselves. Europe is the Committee to Prevent Torture, Inhuman Treatment and Degrading Treatment. Um, the Foreign Secretary will be aware that that committee against torture had raised concerns last year concerning UK immigration policy when it comes to the detention of vulnerable people who are seeking asylum, no matter how they get to the UK. Uh, the Foreign Secretary's signature is on the Rwanda Treaty, which, enabled by the Rwanda Bill, will mean that a trafficked woman who ends up in the UK against her knowledge and against her will through an irregular route will now be detained and sent to Rwanda under his policy. This is, as the committee said, a reversal of the commitment given by the Prime Minister in 2016 to introduce a clear presumption against detention of vulnerable people. Does the Foreign Secretary not agree with me that on the 75th anniversary of the Council of Europe, we should be strengthening our support for vulnerable trafficked people coming to the UK rather than to be reneging on the commitments given? I think what we should be doing is dealing with the problem of very visible illegal migration, which is a problem not just in this country, and, uh, but a problem all over the world. And to do that, every country has to come up with an answer of what it's going to do. And as I've explained in this dispatch box before, because it's not possible to do immediate returns to France, that's not something that is currently negotiable, that is why we have the Rwanda judgment. I mean, I've been looking at this issue for well over a decade. I remember the Chahal case back in the 1990s, which, you know, where the court it was that determined that you couldn't balance anymore what's the risk to Britain of a dangerous terrorist staying and what's the risk to that dangerous terrorist if they're deported. There was no balance. 
the right was absolute. Now, you can argue that's a good thing or it's a bad thing. My argument would be that that's the sort of thing we need to debate and decide in Parliament rather than simply rely on a court. Yeah, yeah. International Organisation. Has the Foreign Secretary had time to reflect on the comments of Liz Truss, who said that uh, she would like to see the United Nations abolished because she claimed she doesn't see a purpose for the organisation. So, uh, has he got any message to those of us who can't see a purpose of Liz Trust? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I take the view that the United Nations has, has uh, many problems and issues and the frustrations of dealing with the Security Council at the moment when you've got a Russian veto and a Chinese veto, these frustrations are very great. But nonetheless, it's important. We have an international body where issues can be discussed, where countries can come together. Good work is done through the United Nations in spite of the frustrations. So, I can see the point of the United Nations. <laughs> my Lords, uh, my... my, my, my has at its heart the enforcement of human rights and yet to some of us the situation in Europe in relation to human rights is sliding backwards whether it's Poland, Hungary, Greece, Germany, Spain and Portugal all lurching to the right. One of the worst is Poland. The Council of Europe is a place where Britain and Poland share a forum. Poland is in breach and has been for decades of its moral and legal duty to make restitution of property stolen from victims of the Second World War, not to mention Poland's clampdown on the judiciary and the freedom of press and women's rights. Will the Foreign Secretary use the Council of Europe to take Poland to task? Uh, I, my interpretation of recent political movements in Poland is they rather move back to the centre, having elected um, Donald Tusk and my counterpart uh, Radek Sikorsky. The, the, I'll look specifically at the point about restitution because I'm not aware of that specific point, but I make the broader point that one of the reasons why some of these more fringe parties are doing well in Europe, and look at the Portuguese elections, for instance, is because mainstream politicians haven't done enough to demonstrate that immigration is under control, that illegal immigration is cracked down on, and that migration policies are designed in parliaments, by parliaments, for the specific benefits of the countries. Where you see that happen, in, in Australia, in Canada, they have higher rates of migration than we do, but it's so clear that the policies are designed by those countries, for those countries, they seem to have less of a problem with extremist parties than many countries in Europe. My Lord, uh, I, I think I'm right in saying that the uh, only country in the entire continent which has always rejected membership of the Council of Europe and refused to accept the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights is Belarus, which is a cruel dictatorship with no regard for human rights at all. Russia has been expelled. Uh, he was a little evasive on the present position of the court, and uh, reform is undoubtedly one thing which being, can be collectively agreed upon by all the members of the Council of Europe. But can he not just give a simple categorical assurance on the part of the present government that it will not at any stage contemplate just rejecting membership of the Council of Europe and, or rejecting the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights, which is the most important international institution, particularly for sometimes for the reasons given by the previous questioner. Well, let me be clear, the government sees no inconsistency between its policies and uh, our membership of the Council of Europe, and we don't have any plans to act in the way that he says. The point I'm making, I'm being very frank and open with your Lordship's House, is that there, there are moments of extreme frustration, and he'll remember serving in government with me when the European Court of Human Rights ruled repeatedly that we had to give prisoners the vote. Now, there's nothing in the European Convention that says anything about giving prisoners the vote. To me, it is a decision for democratic parliaments. You can either decide everybody has the vote, irrespective of what crime you've committed, and that's, that, that's your position. That's not my position. I think if you commit a crime, you go to prison, you lose your right to vote. That is a perfectly reasonable, democratic, dare I say, almost liberal position, which you should be entitled to hold. And so when the court told us we, we couldn't hold that opinion, we disagreed with vigour. And the point I'm making is these organisations, they are important, they do good work. But if they overreach, they plant the seeds of their own destruction. My Lords, that concludes the Secretary of State's questions for today.